All right, so I'm starting one minute before, so I'll give you actually uh, three minutes of questions. So uh, my talk today is about uh, this uh, project I've been working on uh, with uh, uh, Fong, who is a fifth year PhD, just graduated, and uh, my advisor, uh, Rob Tipshirani. And uh, I will talk about a neural network with feature sparsity. But before I get there, just to introduce the, the setting, uh, uh, modern machine learning, you guys all know what it looks like. The goal is uh, to Let's see if this is better. The goal is to minimize the predictive loss and to maximize the uh, predictive power. And, and no matter how many hours of debugging or nights that you've spent, at the end of the day, you want to see a curve that looks roughly like that. And this is now, nowadays happening with uh, bigger and bigger uh, amounts of data and more and more complex uh, models. The, in many uh, predictive tasks and in many uh, real life applications, the state of the art tools tend to use neural networks. So this is an example of a, a neural network architecture on the right side that you could use a convolutional neural network for computer uh, vision tasks. And uh, recently we've seen a dramatic improvement in uh, predictive power. This is an example of a computer vision competition where just 10 years ago the uh, best performing uh, tool was way uh, behind uh, human accuracy and actually didn't use uh, neural networks or anything like that. It was uh, more based on mixers of Gaussians and support vector machines techniques. And starting from uh, 2012, we've seen a, a consistent trend where the winner is always uh, based on some neural network technique. And you can also notice that uh, uh, every single year, the name of the winner is different, which just tells you how much uh, effort have been going into this optimization. And uh, it's needless to say how, uh, how prevalent uh, deep learning is in uh, pretty much every uh, area of modern uh, research and, and technology. And we have here a few applications in healthcare and uh, drug discovery or recommender systems. We, we have some people in the audience from, uh, from Google and from other companies that uh, heavily rely on, on, on these tools. But actually, no, no matter the, uh, the field, the moment you have a very data rich problem, you can think about uh, using a technique like this one and you can be sure there, there is someone out there that is looking into uh, potential applications. So uh, this is really an extremely uh, pervasive uh, kind of technology. But on the other hand, we want to go beyond predictive power. And in many applications, the mandate is not just to come with an extremely uh, powerful predictive tool, but you also have some constraints in terms of understanding what the model is doing. So interpretability is also an, an important part of the, of, the, of the question. And if uh, uh, you're a physician who's using an AI-based tool to uh, assist your diagnosis, then you, you would rather know how the uh, algorithm reached that conclusion before taking action based on it. And the focus of my approach here will be on feature-based explanations, which, which is that we're going to uh, examine our, our data sets and our variables to try and extract the most relevant uh, features for, for, for some outcome of interest. So you could think about it as uh, you're, you're, uh, you have, a, say, a medical problem where we're trying to predict the probability of a person uh, getting some disease and your, your data, your variables are 20,000 genes and you believe that there is a small subset of, of the genes that actually can explain most if not all of your uh, outcome. So the, the underlying belief is that uh, sparsity can help us. And sparsity is not a new tool. We've uh, seen and uh, this department has actually uh, produced a lot of the uh, foundations behind using sparse methods for prediction. And they're not just limited to least squares regression, which is the original setting where they started, but it's, uh, they they, there's no reason why they should actually. And I will even show you that in fact, uh, they have virtues that extend way beyond. And uh, by having a smaller, uh, more compact model, of course, you can also improve the, it's easier to train it and to, and to test it. And you might think that a sparser model actually loses information or power, but we'll see that in some situations that's actually the, not the case. That's, that's the opposite, that you may even gain in, in, uh, in accuracy by, by using sparse models. 
So the general setting here you've guessed is a, a neural network. I'm starting here with the most simple uh, building block, the one layer perceptron, which is not new. The one layer perceptron is, uh, dates back to the 50s with Frank Rosenblatt and I'm showing you here the inputs, which is the features that you care about, on which you would like to perform some uh, selection. You can imagine that you have a large number of them, much, much more than, uh, more than, than four. And then uh, your, your model basically will, our model will penalize uh, groups of features, uh, basically all the weights that originate from one feature in such a way that, that, we, can, that we can achieve uh, feature selection. So this is not a new idea as I have presented it to you. There, there is uh, existing uh, implementations that rely usually on subgradient methods. The, the problem with the subgradient methods is that they do not achieve exact sparsity. Uh, in fact, in the, uh, in the, in the limit, when, when the number of iterations uh, goes to infinity, you, you will reach a sparse solution, but the <sighs> convergence is slow. And in practice, what happens is people, you, you will rely on a post hoc thresholding step where you look at your model after training and will just set the group, the weights that are less than some arbitrary maybe threshold or some threshold that you pick to zero. And then you might retrain the model based on that initial subset or do something like that. But instead we will rely on a, a different approach that, uh, so this is, this is a problem from the optimization perspective. But in addition to that, I will introduce a model that's slightly simpler. And my approach here, as I show it, actually is based on a residual neural network. What that means is that on, on top of the sigmoid function that I use, the activation function, I have just a pure linear term. And I will use that linear component to constrain all of the model. So uh, this is uh, basically the, the, the model formulation where uh, the goal is to minimize some uh, loss on your data. And on top of that, you have some uh, some, some, some penalty, an L1 norm, uh, on your linear coefficient. And to make sure that the entire model is sparse, we basically constrain the nonlinear coefficients, the neural part of the model, to by the linear part. So up to some multiplicative factor, the nonlinear weights are smaller in magnitude than, than the linear part. And of course, the moment the, uh, the, the linear uh, corresponding feature is, uh, is, is null, then that forces the entire group of, of coefficients to, to, to be zero. This model has two parameters that you can play with. The first one is uh, classical regularization parameter that uh, actually you might uh, pick by cross-validation, say. And the, the second parameter that I introduce here controls the strength of the interaction between the linear and nonlinear part. So if you have a prior about your, your data that you believe the line signal is strongly linear, then you might pick a smaller value of, of that parameter. Or on the other side, you might pick a larger value in a situation with highly nonlinear signal. So, so this, this, this model basically makes this uh, be, has this belief that you can use the linear part of the signal to capture uh, whatever part of uh, whatever relevant signal there is, but even if the signal is not linear, you can still do something. And then I will show you examples where you, there, there is no reason actually, uh, there is no maybe no linear signal classification tasks with images, but when we still ma manage to capture uh, the, the, the signal. So the problem, as I stated, it is, uh, is not easy to optimize. And it's one thing to define an optimization problem that seems to achieve your purpose. And it's another one to solve it. So uh, it's not, not easy because the, of, uh, the original problem is, of course, we're using a non-convex uh, activation function. And the problem is not convex. But that, that's, that's well known. And that's, that's just a regular setting in which you might uh, use a neural network. But on top of that, I also introduced this additional constraint that is also non-convex. But our approach will actually, I will show you that, that, it's, that it is still possible to to, to, to solve it. And I don't claim to achieve a, a global minimum. That's just uh, impossible. Uh, but if you have a way of uh, doing that, actually, I, I'd be interested. But 
just in terms of performing gradient steps, we will basically perform a constrained gradient descent using a, a proximal algorithm. And this proximal step is not convex either because you have this, uh, uh, this constraint. But it turns out that there is a closed form solution and that you can efficiently find it. So what I'm showing you here is the shape of the uh, uh, smaller optimization problems that you need to solve at each gradient step. So it turns out that these problems, basically, uh, there, is, there is two ways that you want to solve for. One is for the linear coefficient. Another one is for the, the entire set of nonlinear weights. The problem is actually separable over the features, which is why you only see one linear coefficient there. So I'm only showing you a problem for, for, for one feature, and you can actually solve them all independently. So this is something you could parallelize if, if, that's, uh, if you'd like. But essentially, the complexity of solving this problem is just that of sorting the, uh, the weights, the, the, the previous weights that you have. So uh, you, you end up using a softmax function, which, which performs soft thresholding. And that's the underlying basis behind uh, reaching sparsity. So, so you end up with essentially this, 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 this problem complexity. And despite the, the non-convexity, which, 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 which we saw uh, at first, you can actually get an uh, efficient solution. So now that you know how to solve this problem, you can, you can think about getting an entire path of models. By varying the uh, regularization parameter, you, you, get a, you get a path which is similar to the path you might get for the lasso. And then you might think about using warm starts if you have solved the problem for one value of the penalty to uh, use that as an initial starting point for the next value. And that will just uh, greatly ease training, of course. One major difference that I will point out here between uh, the optimization of lasso net and the classical lasso optimization is the order in which you might optimize the path. And we have observed that going from dense to sparse tends to uh, greatly improve the solution that you find, which is unlike the lasso where you start from a really sparse solution and then use that to build the, the, the rest of the path by, by adding coordinates one by one or so. And this might have to do with the original problem's non-convexity and the landscape of the objective function that, uh, that, uh, that you're minimizing. But this is just an empirical finding that, uh, that we have observed. So in terms of numerical comparisons, in the, uh, in the five minutes or so that I have left, I will show you first some uh, simulated results where we try to compare uh, lasso net to the regular lasso and to a standard neural network with the same architecture and to this two-stage procedure where I first use the lasso to get the support of the best model, and then I fit a neural network restricted to that support. So this two-stage procedure basically only uses the uh, pure lasso to, to, get the to do the feature selection. And in all my simulations, I will take 50 hidden units, and I will use the act sigmoid activation function. But, but you, you, ca you can absolutely imagine using different ones if you'd like. So I, I'm showing you three scenarios here. The first scenario is just pure linear signal. This is a situation where you don't need a heavy machinery to, to solve the problem. And, and, and not surprisingly, Lasso performs best. The second two uh, are both strongly nonlinear signal. The major difference is that the third one is non-hierarchical. What that means is that the support of the linear signal and the support of the nonlinear signal are not the same. So the variables that, 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 that affect the signal linearly are not those that affect the signal linearly, nonlinearly. So this is a situation where the two-stage procedure would fail because it relies on first building on the lasso to get the rest. And this is what we observe on, a, uh, on our simulations. And now to a perhaps more exciting application where I use uh, real data. Uh, this is a classification task. So uh, the model, as I showed it, is uh, actually uh, works with 
with both classification and regression tasks. Here, the loss function is just a, a log likelihood of, uh, of the negative log likelihood of, 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 of your binomial case. I use 1,000 data points for training, 2,000 data points for testing, and I just want to classify digit one against digit two. So this is a subset of the MNIST data set where uh, we know that uh, the, I mean, the, the best uh, performance you can get is, uh, is pretty impressive. And here I'm showing you that uh, actually the neural network does best, but the neural network uses the entire set of coefficients. But I can basically provide you with a solution that uses a quarter of the total number of features that a neural network might use and just reach the same, if not better, predictive accuracy. So if you were to look at the weights of your standard neural network, you might get a plot that, like the one on the left. And on the right, I'm showing you the support of LassoNet for the best uh, solution, which is around 200 features. And you can see that it uses much less uh, weights. So, so the shape of the pixels that you see there are basically the pixels that allow you to distinguish one from two. So as a general uh, fact, the goal is not to beat uh, state-of-the-art neural net network architectures, which can be extremely complex, but the, the goal is more to actually get close, if not uh, at identical level of performance, with much, much smaller uh, model complexity. And this is what we achieve on this example. So I have presented to you today uh, LassoNet, which is a model for uh, feature selection in uh, neural networks. And it enables you to build an entire path of models, just like the, the Lasso. It's a way that you, that, uh, of, of, of balancing model complexity and the, and the predictive power. So you have this penalty parameter that you can play with and then that you can actually cross-validate and, and, and pick the optimal uh, model. And I've shown you here applications to just raw features, which were uh, pixels on this image, but you can just as well imagine building some intermediate features from some uh, previous model. Say you're using transfer learning from the, if we were to use the deep learning language. And so long as you're interested in performing feature selection on those, then it, it makes sense to use a tool like this one. And uh, the, the results I've shown you are uh, on a one, uh, one hidden layer neural network, but because we're only penalizing the input layer, this can absolutely scale to, to larger and more complex architectures because we have the same uh, efficient optimization algorithm that's, uh, that's uh, working behind the scenes. So the, uh, the, the core of the implementation was done in, in C. We have a, a front end that's in R that you can uh, use because we'll be releasing a package very soon. In terms of future areas of research, we're considering just an extension to multiple responses where you might think about unsupervised learning tasks, and the goal might be to just learn a small subset of, uh, of your initial uh, features that, that, that capture most of the uh, variability. So it's a, basically a kind of application to autoencoders where you might get nonlinear sparse principal components. So that's a, an active uh, area that we are investigating. And then ideally, we'd like to build a connection between LassoNet and existing neural network architectures where we don't have to uh, build the entire infrastructure from scratch, but if we can connect it to uh, popular tools that are used by, uh, on a daily basis by millions of people and that are backed by hundreds of software engineers working, working full time, then that would be a, a great improvement. So this is something we are, we are considering to, to extend uh, the reach of, of LassoNet. And I will leave it here for now and take any questions you might have. Thank you. So, 
So the, 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 the main problem that I have with uh, uh, subgradient methods here is the fact that you need a post hoc thresholding, which is somewhat arbitrary. So the sparsity is, is built into the, op the objective function, but it's not a natural result of, of, your, of your model. So the convergence, actually, that, that's, uh, of your model will not, a reasonable amount of uh, iterations will not guarantee that sparsity. And then you, you pick some threshold, which is, I mean, uh, you might think how you, you would go about picking such a threshold, but there is no, uh, it's not built within the model. So this is more a problem from the optimization perspective, uh, and this is what's, what's implemented in most uh, uh, existing uh, neural network packages. So uh, L2 regularization will tend to, uh, to, to, to shrink the, the magnitude of, of the weights. So you can think about ridge regression in uh, uh, classical setting. It will not enable feature selection. It might work better if you have uh, problems with highly correlated features or things like that. But actually, it's, it's, uh, it can be built within your model as a, as a on, on top of, of LastSonet, which and it would it would serve different purposes. So the goal would not there be actually interpretability, but more uh, preventing overfitting and, and things like that. But the L1 penalty is specifically uh, the one that that would that would actually enable sparsity. Thank you, Esmeralda. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs>